Honda's fourth generation CRV has evolved into something cleverer, classier and much more efficient. Targeting family crossover models as well as small lifestyle orientated SUVs, it's as strong a package as ever if you're looking at petrol power or an entry level two wheel drive diesel. What's changed though is the option buyers now get of high tech automatic transmission and the now more sophisticated pairing of high performance diesel power and four wheel drive. In other words, this CRV has sharpened up its act. As a result, it's a hard car not to like. How do you write a bestseller? This is Honda's answer, the improved fourth generation version of a compact SUV soft roading CRV model that's frequently been the strongest selling car of its kind in the world. It's already found over 5 million global buyers over the last two decades in over 160 countries, with over 750,000 examples sold in Europe since the original launch in 1997. This updated design isn't radically different from the original Mark IV version we first saw towards the end of 2012, but the changes Honda has made are nonetheless significant, as is necessary in a segment now saturated with clever rivals. So we have a smarter shape, a classier cabin, more efficient engines, stronger safety and extra high-tech equipment. The headache for Honda, though, is that all of its obvious competitors in this sector have recently launched rival models claiming much the same, which perhaps explains why this isn't a car that jumps out at you from the spec sheet. No, you have to drive it, use it, fill it with family. Many of those experienced in doing just that probably won't even look at the alternatives before replacing their second, third or early fourth generation CRVs with this improved Mark IV model launched here in the spring of 2015. It does, after all, offer a depth of engineering that many other rivals just don't have, though there's some difficulty in determining just which kinds of cars these are. Compact soft-roading SUVs like Toyota's RAV4 are an obvious target, but Honda also expects lower-order CRVs to appeal to buyers looking at slightly more affordable Qashqai-class crossover models, and hopes that plusher versions of this car will even attract folk who might be looking at a pricier, premium compact SUV with a prestigious badge on the bonnet. Is all of that likely? Well, the chances are good. After all, this car's appeal for the crossover crowd has been much enhanced since the introduction of Honda's award-winning 120 PS 1.6 litre iDTEC diesel engine. And at the other end of the scale, it's now possible for premium-minded folk to more credibly consider this CRV too, thanks to the introduction of that same efficient engine in Pokia 160 PS guys, plus a higher tech nine-speed automatic gearbox option and a much smarter cabin. But will it all be enough to keep this car at the forefront of this fragmenting segment? That's what we're here to find out. Those looking for a compact SUV with the sharpest on-road handling have rarely tended to end up at a Honda dealership. Instead, they've gravitated towards cars like Toyota RAV4s and BMW X3s. Likewise, those buyers wanting a contender in this class that's happy to sit up to its sills in mud would probably start first with a Land Rover or a Jeep product. So where does this leave this CRV? Scrabbling around for customers who don't quite know what they want? Or, as Honda suggests, positioned perfectly for people who don't live to ridiculous extremes. Enormous global CRV sales suggest that they may have a point. This car's popularity achieved from the big percentage of customers who just want a compact SUV with a comfortably elevated driving position, offering plenty of room and a refined, composed on the road experience. It doesn't need to be hugely quick and it doesn't need a yard of ground clearance. No. What it needs to do is that really tricky thing, strike all the right compromises. As soon as you figure that out, you'll start seeing where the Honda CRV is so clever. Or at least it is now, let me explain. The majority of customers looking for a family size crossover model or a compact SUV ideally want all wheel drive with efficient diesel power. And a number of them would also like that recipe matched with sophisticated automatic transmission. 
In its original Mark IV model form, this CRV struggled in its provision of all of these things. The diesel you originally had to have on 4x4 models was a relatively thirsty, dirty 2.2 litre ID tech unit. And if you didn't want manual transmission, you had to have the old tech 5 speed auto gearbox that sent your running cost figures soaring. This time around, it's very different. These days, with this Honda, ID tech power is developed from a smaller, far more efficient 1.6 litre engine. You get it with 160 PS mated exclusively with four wheel drive, or with 120 PS mated exclusively with two wheel drive. The Pokia one, the one I'm trying here, has the best power to consumption ratio in its segment and is the only engine in the range that gives you the option of the other key development added to this improved Mark IV model, Honda's nine speed automatic transmission. Those extra ratios make quite a difference, allowing for a very low first gear that gives responsive performance and a super high top gear ratio for a lower fuel consumption and greater refinement at cruising speeds. It's a great partner to this car. Here though I've got the six speed manual gearbox, although that's no hardship, the gear lever beautifully placed and the shift action slick and satisfying. Get your changes right and the two-stage turbo that differentiates this 160 PS diesel powers you to 62 miles an hour in 9.8 seconds en route to 125 miles an hour. At mid-range engine speeds, both turbos work in tandem to optimize airflow to your engine, allowing you to dispatch slower moving traffic with ease. Still, not everyone will need that level of performance or four-wheel drive, hence the appeal of the 1.6 iDTEC 120 PS two-wheel drive variant, which manages the 62 miles an hour sprint in 11.2 seconds on the way to 115 miles an hour. I should point out that the CRV range still offers buyers a petrol option. Indeed, it's one of the few cars in the segment that still sells in any meaningful numbers fueled from the green pump. The engine in question is the same 155 PS 2 litre IVTEC unit used in the original version of this model and like the majority of Honda petrol power plants responds best if you put a few revs on the board. OK, a lot of revs on the board. It's certainly a willing unit but the whole reviness thing might not be quite so endearing when the car's fully loaded or when you're in a tricky situation, attempting to winch yourself up a snowy incline for example. Petrol people do get more choice than their diesel counterparts though, with both two-wheel drive and four-wheel drive model options. Go for the 4x4 variant and you can also opt for an automatic gearbox, though petrol CRVs have to use the old five-speed auto unit. On the subject of four-wheel drive, you might wonder whether it's really worth specifying. After all, most Qashqai class crossovers and many small SUVs do without that feature these days. We'd suggest you consider this on this CRV though. There isn't much of an efficiency downside and there's lots to be gained in poor conditions or if you're a tower. A four-wheel drive IDTEC 160 PS manual variant like the one I'm trying here can tow a braked trailer of up to two tons with the process further aided by a trailer stabilization system. As before, the 4x4 setup this CRV favors is what the brand calls a real-time all-wheel drive system. In other words, it's one of those arrangements that sends drive to the front wheels nearly all of the time, pushing torque rearwards only when a loss of traction is detected. In that situation, there's no need to mess about with extra gear levers or buttons. Everything's done for you. If you infer from that that we're talking here of 4x4 capability intended for icy mornings and muddy car parks rather than trips into the wilderness, then you'd be right. There simply isn't the wheel articulation or the proper four-wheel drive hardware for any meaningful expeditions off-piste. You don't get enough ground clearance for that either. Two-wheel drive models sitting 155 millimeters from the ground and even the four-wheel drive version set only 165 millimeters from the deck. Still, you might attempt a few snowy slopes with confidence thanks to a hill start assist system that'll help you up them. And if you've an automatic model, a hill descent control setup that'll gently ease you down the other side. Of far more relevance though is the way this car drives on ordinary everyday tarmac. Capability Honda has tried hard to sharpen up with this revised model. Hence the increases to front and rear track to improve stability and the increase in steering ratio for more response at the helm. As for comfort, well, changes to the front suspension bushes, the dampers and the lower arm knuckle geometry have been made to improve the ride. 
And a range of measures have improved refinement too, with things like extra sound deadening, thicker door seals and better floor carpet, cutting noise levels by up to 6%. Has it all worked? Well, to some extent, yes. From a driving perspective, this still isn't the most engaging small SUV you could choose, but it is at least a more fluid companion for those occasions when you really do need to push on over twistier routes. Body control is especially good thanks to a low center of gravity and taut body rigidity that you'll thank Honda for if you've kids often made a bit queasy by the kind of low frequency roll and pitch that's still common to so many SUVs. This CRV remains at its best though when you're asking very little of it. Those noise reduction measures have made what was already a very refined car class leadingly quiet and the ride quality is definitely better too. The result is a machine beautifully fit for purpose. If you knew anything at all about Honda CRVs, you would probably recognize this as the latest car in the line. It's almost as if the Japanese brand's designers were told that they needed to take the fourth generation model and give it more presence, more personality and more panache but they just couldn't bring themselves to go too far. Perhaps that's as it should be. This car's visual appeal has always been low key and you sense that's exactly the way loyal customers like it. Look a little closer and to be fair, a lot of work has gone into updating things. The front end adopts a more dynamic, planted stance with redesigned headlamps flanked by LED daytime running lights flowing into a smarter new grille. The bumper's been restyled too, along with a skid plate, both features giving this CRV a wider, more planted appearance whilst also lowering the car's visual centre of gravity. Move to the side and apart from freshly styled 17 or 18 inch alloy wheels, things are much as before with this sharp character line flowing from the front wheel arch, underscoring these chunky door handles and ultimately fading into this pronounced D pillar with its angular chrome trimmed window line. At the rear, the stacked LED combination lamps have been restyled to try and give the car a more fluid three dimensional appearance. They're linked by this chrome central band with general SUV-ness emphasised by the rear skid plate. It's all very neat, if a little unremarkable. Future Hondas will probably be more extreme than this in their appearance and will need to be in an age when rivals like Range Rovers Evoque have redefined buyers' aesthetic expectations. For the time being though, this car will blend smartly into the background. And you know what? I don't really care. Let me show you why. You can keep your posh badges and your avant-garde design work. Personally, what I really want from an SUV is stuff like, well, I'll show you. You pull either this little fabric handle on the seat base or either of the cargo sidewall levers in the luggage bay and the seat base tumbles forward, the seat back dips down and the rear headrest tucks in snugly. This has to be one of the cleverest seat folding mechanisms around. A lovely piece of engineering that, as you can see, leaves the seat folder completely flat. The kind of thing you'd find useful day in, day out. It's an example of design that makes a difference. Design that perhaps no one will appreciate but you. But probably that's as it should be. With the rear bench drop flat like this, you've 1,648 litres of space available, or 1,669 litres if your car isn't fitted with a space-saving spare wheel. That's enough, so Honda says, to take three 29-inch wheel mountain bikes with space remaining for their riders, thanks to a 1,570mm load length. Even with the rear seat in place, there's 589 litres on offer, easy enough for, say, four sets of golf clubs. To give you some perspective, the space on offer is about 10% less than you get in a rival Toyota RAV4, but it's around 25% more than you get from other segment competitors like Ford's Cougar and Volkswagen's Tiguan. Importantly, the space you do get is very usable. It's easy to get things in thanks to a usefully low loading lip height. And once your stuff's inside, features like this optional tough cargo bay floor cover keep the luggage area safe from scuffs and scratches. 
I'd also want to consider the extra cost cargo pack that allows you to subdivide the boot area. Let me give you another example of the kind of little design detail that makes the CRV simply easier to live with than many of its flashier rivals. If, for example, you were to buy a rival BMW X3, you might well be faced with aggro every morning over which child should be forced to sit in the middle seat in the back. The unfortunate nominee having to tuck their knees under their chin the whole way to school because of the big transmission tunnel extending down the middle of the car. Now choose a CRV and there are no such headaches. Even in the four-wheel drive models, the floor is completely flat. Come to think of it, this really is a remarkably spacious place to sit when you consider that this fourth generation design is actually a little smaller than its pre-2012 Mark III model predecessor. Yes, it is a pity that this bench no longer slides back and forth as it did on the old car, but it does still recline for greater comfort on longer journeys. There's an airy feel too, thanks to the square practical exterior lines facilitating a decently sized glass area. Only the chunky rear pillars intrude on all round rear vision, though that is enough to make reversing around a corner a feat you'll prefer to complete with the aid of the rear parking camera and parking sensors that you'll find fitted to all but models with entry level trim. <coughs> And up front, well, you still might not nominate this cabin as the smartest in the class, but as you'll discover after regular use, it's better thought out than most and features exemplary build quality from the British factory in Swindon. Talking of quality, nicer materials have been used on all the key surfaces and above entry level trim, you get this attractive chrome effect inlay running the width of the dashboard. Some things haven't changed though. Like almost any Honda I can think of, the driving position is exemplary, with an enormous range of adjustment available for both the wheel and the huge seats, obviously designed for ample American buttocks in this car's biggest market. With this Mark IV model, Honda sets those chairs lower and moves them further apart to create a more spacious feel that's made room for this sliding armrest. This includes Osmond's space to build upon the usual other storage solutions dotted around the cabin, including large door bins, a compartment for your sunglasses and a decently sized glove box. So this car is easy to live with and comfortable to drive too. We particularly like the way that the gear stick is located just a few inches from the steering wheel for snickety quick changes. As for the instruments, well, it's all very different from the space age Star Trek style layout that Honda uses in its Civic family hatch. Through the thick three spoke multifunction steering wheel, you view a simpler, more conventional layout, though still quite a clever one with a huge speedo that features a central digital display and is flanked by an ambient light meter that changes color according to the efficiency of your driving style. The other design key point in this cabin is what the designers call the information interface zone. Essentially this area here in the centre of the dash, just above the air conditioning controls. The top recessed readout is what Honda calls its iMID, or Intelligent Multi-Information Display Screen. There to provide useful information like the time, your audio settings and your trip computer functions. All of it operable via the leather trimmed steering wheel. The key change though with this revised model lies below with the addition of this larger 7 inch Honda Connect colour infotainment touchscreen. Provided you avoid entry level trim, this Android based setup is standard across the range, controlling stereo and informational functions, dealing with the optional Garmin SatNav system and providing full internet browsing when you're stationary. For that kind of use, this setup should feel just like your smartphone to use, thanks not only to familiar pinch, swipe and tap functionality, but also to a clever mirror link function that allows you to mirror your mobile handset screen display and gain access to its applications. You can personalise the touch screen with a choice between two different skins and download your favourite apps onto it via the Honda App Centre. In fact, one key app, AHA, will come preloaded with the system, giving you access to thousands of stations of audio, spanning everything from music to news, podcasts and audiobooks, plus social media and location-based services. 
The integrated interface should make finding everything from a Twitter account to weather updates so easy, even I could manage to do it. And AHA also includes points of interest searches, helping users locate things like nearby restaurants and hotels. One of the most interesting things about the CRV is how many potential customer segments it can satisfy. Let me explain. If you're looking for a compact, family-sized, high-riding SUV-style car in the 20 to £30,000 price bracket, you'll come across three main kinds of product. At the lower end of that spectrum, you'll find Qashqai-like crossover models that handle well but are pretty much useless off-road. Priced a little above these are the RAV4 style small SUVs against which this Honda has traditionally competed. Cars that are a little less sharp to drive but also a little better in the rough stuff. And beyond that, if your budget goes beyond £30,000, there are premium small 4x4s like Audi's Q5 and BMW's X3 that try and combine tarmac and all-terrain capability with more of a luxury feel in return for a hefty price tag. Across a lineup that stretches roughly between £22,000 and £32,000 and incorporates petrol and diesel, two- and four-wheel drive, this Honda aims to offer something to satisfy potential customers in all three of these categories, which is why it's been such a strong seller for the brand. It's most likely, though, that potential CRV buyers will also be leafing through the glossy brochures for soft-roading small SUVs, cars like the Toyota RAV4 and the Nissan X-Trail, maybe even Jeep's Cherokee, models this Honda has been priced directly against. Some customers might also be considering a few rivals that will cost slightly less, cars that stray more closely into the less capable crossover segment. Here we're thinking of models like Mazda's CX-5, Volkswagen's Tiguan and Ford's Cougar. If you really never ventured off tarmac and want to save even more, you might want to look at similarly orientated models like Kia Sportage or Hyundai's iX35, maybe even a Nissan Qashqai too. Ultimately, it really comes down to what you want. So much of the overview. On to some specifics. This CRV is one of the few cars of this kind that sells in any volume with petrol power. The 2-litre iVTEC variant available in both two-wheel drive and four-wheel drive geysers. All-wheel traction offered at a £1,000 premium. Over 60% of the buyers for this car, though, want a diesel. And Honda offers two versions of its acclaimed 1.6-litre iDTEC unit to satisfy them. The crossover crowd will be happy with the lower-powered 120 PS derivative, which comes only with two-wheel drive and manual transmission. It's yours at a model-for-model -model premium of just over £1,000 over the equivalent petrol version. So, in other words, diesel CRV ownership starts at around the £23,500 mark. If you're considering one of the plusher diesel variants, your dealer will probably suggest that you think about finding the £2,000 model-for-model premium necessary to graduate up to the 160 PS 1.6 litre iDTEC power plant we've been trying here. As well as the extra grunt, that additional outlay gets you four-wheel drive, which is standard at this level. Choose your CRV with either petrol power or the top diesel unit and you'll be offered the option of an automatic gearbox at a premium that's typically around £1,500 to £1,600. With a top iDTEC engine, this gets you Honda's latest 9-speed auto unit, but buyers of petrol variants must make do with the old 5-speed auto box from the previous model. If having considered all of this, you conclude that you want something more than a Qashqai class crossover, but don't feel the need to stretch up to a pricey small SUV with a premium badge, then it's highly likely that this CRV could represent exactly what you're looking for. If so, then you're going to need to know exactly how generous Honda has been with the standard spec. And the answer is that most of what you're likely to really need is included, even with entry-level trim. So even entry-level S models get 17-inch alloy wheels, LED daytime running lights, power windows and mirrors, and an alarm immobiliser. Inside, you get dual-zone climate control, Bluetooth for your phone, driver's seat height adjustment, 
cruise control with a speed limiter, those clever one-touch folding rear seats and a multi-information display, a decent quality four-speaker stereo system and a DAB radio, plus USB and iPod connectivity. You also get a standard space saver spare wheel, which amazingly isn't always included on cars of this kind. The major option for CRV buyers at S-Spec level is satellite navigation, which comes packaged up with the Honda Connect 7-inch colour infotainment touchscreen. Via this, you can also access internet radio, download apps from the Honda App Centre, listen to a higher quality six-speaker stereo and use a rear parking camera. Upgrade yourself to the next trim level up in the CRV range hierarchy, SE, and you get Honda Connect as standard, although you still need to pay extra for navigation. The premium that the SE spec requires, around £2,200, also gets you features like front fog lights, auto headlamps and wipers, leather for the steering wheel and the gear knob, front and rear parking sensors, power folding mirrors, an auto dimming rear view mirror and an alloy effect instrument panel inlay that really lifts the cabin. The SE trim level is the lowest spec point from which you can have a CRV with automatic transmission, four wheel drive, the Pokia 160 PS diesel engine or perhaps all three of these things. Inevitably though, of course, the real nice is to be found on the plushest models or on the options list. Things like leather upholstery, heated seats, larger 18-inch alloy wheels, ambient cabin lighting, a panoramic glass roof, a powered tailgate, privacy glass, colour-coded roof rails, plus by HID headlights that come with auto-leveling, washers and an active cornering function. I also like the neat tablet holders that you can specify that allow your rear seat passengers to attach things like iPads to frames that clip on behind the front seat headrests. Perfect for keeping the kids quiet without going to all the expense of a fully-fledged rear seat entertainment system. Talking of entertainment, there is the option of a high-power audio system with subwoofer, but we think we'd simply choose to add Honda's neat 3D sound pack to whatever stereo system our chosen trim level included. This delivers a compact DSP, or digital sound processing unit, that'll much enhance your listening experience. On a more practical note, you might want to tick the box for a tow bar. And if you don't care about off-road capability, consider running boards that aid vehicle entry and exit. Personally, I'd want to talk to my dealer about the crossbars and roof attachments that would enable me to attach things like ski boxes, roof boxes or bicycle attachments to the roof. And I'd want to look at the optional cargo pack with its premium trunk organiser that enables you to subdivide the boot area so that your eggs don't end up mixing with your iron brew. Maybe also the convenience pack that's there to protect the car from scrapes and dings and dents. As for aesthetic flourishes, well, these are covered off by the chrome pack, the aero pack or the illumination pack. They're all there to give the exterior and interior of the car a more bespoke look. On to safety, where it's good to find that Honda has standardised their useful City Brake Active system across the range. They're to scan the road ahead for potential collision hazards at speeds of under 20 miles an hour. If one's detected, you'll be warned. If you don't respond, or you aren't able to, then the car will automatically brake itself to decrease the severity of any resulting accident. If you want to go even further than that and have avoided entry-level trim, then there's the affordable option of a driver assistance safety pack, the DASP option, that's been fitted to the car we've been trying here. You really need to think about ticking the DASP box if you're a CRV buyer, for it includes a whole raft of clever electronic features that together will make it very difficult to hurt yourself in this car. Things like a forward collision warning system that warns you audibly and visually if you're getting too close to the car in front. The DASP pack also includes a blind spot information system to stop you from dangerously pulling out to overtake in front of another car. Also part of the deal is a cross traffic monitor there to stop you from reversing out from a parking space into the path of another car a lane departure warning system to warn dozy drivers if they're fearing out of their lanes onto the highway, a high beam support feature that'll automatically dip your lights for you at night in the face of oncoming traffic, 
and you get traffic sign recognition there to picture road signs as you pass and display them onto the dash. There's a lot in the DSP pack then, but you can still add even more safety cleverness if you happen to have chosen your CRV with the plushest EX trim level. Here, buyers can also tick the box for the Honda Sensing package that gets you as close as you're probably currently going to get to the kind of car that can almost drive itself, thanks to the provision of three more clever sensor-based active safety systems. The first of these, the Collision Mitigating Braking System, develops the technology of the City Brake Active Setup I mentioned earlier and applies it at higher speeds over a longer range. This means that in all driving scenarios, not just low-speed urban ones, the car will constantly be scanning the road ahead for accident hazards and applying the brakes if you don't respond quickly enough to avoid them. The sensing package also gives you a couple of really useful features for extra motorway peace of mind. Let's say you're tired and your CRV is wandering out of its lane. Earlier I mentioned a system that would warn you of the fact, but with the sensing package you get a lane keeping assist system that will actually steer you back into your lane should such a thing occur. The feeling is actually a bit eerie as is the cleverness of the intelligent adaptive cruise control system. Via radar, this automatically keeps you a set distance to the car in front at cruising speeds and is able to intelligently adapt itself when another driver cuts in ahead of you, detecting such a scenario up to five seconds before it actually happens. As you can see then, there are a lot of ways you can upgrade the safety of your CRV. Even if you choose only to order the car in its standard form though, you should find it a very safe place to put your family. A fact evidenced by this model's five-star Euro NCAP test showing. All versions get the usual twin front, side and curtain airbags, though no knee bag is included. Plus you get all kinds of electronic acronyms to hopefully ensure that you'll never have to use them. There's an agile handling assist system to help with corner turning and vehicle stability assist, Honda's version of the kind of ESC stability control system you now expect on a car of this kind. Also, par for the course is an ABS braking setup with an emergency braking assist to aid in panic stops, advertised to following motorists by automatically activating brake and hazard warning lights. Other standard safety features include hill start assist to stop you from drifting backwards on uphill junctions and active front head restraints to minimise accident whiplash, a tyre deflation warning system and Isofix child seat fastenings, plus a front end section of the car designed to minimise pedestrian injuries. The original version of this fourth generation CRV may have been promoted as an all new product, but it had to persevere with a very inefficient 2.2 litre diesel power plant and a past its sell by date five speed automatic transmission that couldn't be engineered to work with engine start stop technology. Back in 2012, all of this put Honda on the back foot with this car from the very start and made it difficult for the Mark IV model CRV to credibly compete with many of its more mechanically up-to-date rivals. Back then, a 2.2-litre iDTEC automatic CRV put out around 40 grams per kilometre of CO2 more than equivalent versions of direct rivals like Ford's Cougar and Mazda CX-5, and would take you around 10 fewer miles on every gallon. This wasn't good enough. The first signs that Honda was getting with the programme in terms of class competitive diesel efficiency came with the introduction of their award-winning 1.6-litre iDTEC Earth Dreams engine to this car a year after its launch. This, though, was a Civic's 120 PS unit, a power plant that couldn't be mated either to four-wheel drive or to automatic transmission. It continues for lower order CRV models in this updated model range, but has here been joined by an updated 160 PS 1.6 litre iDTEC unit, the one I'm trying here. This only comes with four wheel drive and offers buyers the option of one of the most sophisticated automatic gearboxes available. A nine speed unit that has hardly any impact on your running cost figures thanks to its lighter weight and high top gear ratios. Sounds promising, doesn't it? Well, let's look at the figures. 
The 160 PS 1.6 litre ID.Tech manual gearbox four-wheel drive CRV I'm trying here manages 55.4 miles per gallon on the combined cycle and 125 grams per kilometre of CO2. So it's around 10% more frugal and 15% cleaner than the old equivalent 2.2 litre ID.Tech model. Better still, whereas with that old car, your running costs increased substantially if you went for automatic transmission. This time round, with the high-tech nine-speed auto box, the impact of the self-shifter is marginal. Figures falling only to 53.3 miles per gallon and 139 grams per kilometre. And if Honda could get their idle stop-start-stop stop system to work with auto transmission, the returns would certainly be better still. CRV buyers happy with a manual gearbox along with two-wheel drive and the lower powered 120 PS version of the 1.6 litre ID.Tech power plant will find that the cost of running this Honda will be no more than they'd pay to operate an ordinary Focus class hatch. Such buyers would be looking at 64.2 miles per gallon on the combined cycle and 115 grams per kilometre of CO2. Bear in mind too that this car also comes in petrol form. Go for that two-litre IVTEC variant and in two-wheel drive manual guys you're supposed to be able to return 39.2 miles per gallon and 168 grams per kilometre. Figures that fall only marginally to 38.2 miles per gallon and 173 grams per kilometre if you go for the four-wheel drive version. And it's four-wheel drive you have to have if you want a petrol-powered CRV with automatic transmission. Though here we're talking of the old five-speed auto unit. All of these figures sound fine on paper, but of course, in the real world, ultimate economy is very much dependent upon your driving style. And Honda is committed to helping its owners try to improve that, primarily through the use of this econ button. When activated, fuel economy is improved by automatic adjustments to the throttle response, the engine control systems and the air conditioning. With petrol models, it amends the cruise control too. As far as I can see, the only reason why you'd ever turn it off would be to avoid the slightly distracting Eco Assist setup that activates when you press the Econ button. This uses a system of colours around the speedometer to flag up whether your driving style is conducive to maximum efficiency. If the car is being driven economically, the speedo flanking strips glow green and you get an encouraging little plant icon as environmental encouragement. Slightly exceed the optimum level of throttle control and the strips will then glow white and green. And during heavy acceleration and deceleration, it'll glow white. You soon get the idea. Residual values for the CRV have always been very good indeed, with no shortage of family buyers queuing up to take well looked after cars off your hands. Independent industry experts reckon that after the usual three year, 30,000 mile ownership period, you could expect around 43% of your original purchase price back, which is very good for a car that doesn't wear one of the premium German badges. That only leaves insurance groupings. Base your calculations around groupings of either 22E or 23E if you're looking at the 2-litre IVTEC petrol models or the 120 PS 1.6 IDTEC two-wheel drive variants. If you're looking at one of the top 160 PS four-wheel drive diesel derivatives like I'm trying here, you'll be looking at groupings of either 26E or 27E. It's easy to imagine yourself as target market for a model like this CRV. You have a couple of kids, an active lifestyle, a need to haul things around and an aversion to rather dull large estate cars. The thing is though, you've also an aversion to the kind of RAV4 style compact SUV soft roaders that such a mindset would normally direct you towards. Understandably, perhaps you think they're all rather pretentious and silly, but this car isn't. It's an SUV for people who don't like SUVs. A car for people who look at what a vehicle can do for them rather than what it says about them. End use, you see, has been the overriding design parameter here. Not cutting edge styling, clever gadgetry, irrelevant pin sharp handling or pointlessly powerful engines. As a result, it's an extremely easy thing to live with. The kind of car you'll own and then wonder how you manage without.
That may not be a recipe for media headlines, but it is an approach that other brands could certainly learn from. And it explains why so many CRVs are bought by folk who previously owned one. There are people who wholeheartedly approve of the changes that Honda has made to this fourth generation version. The smarter looks, the extra connectivity, the classier feel, and most importantly, the much more efficient way it lets you enjoy diesel power with four wheel drive. All of these things ought to allow the CRV to reach out beyond its traditional customer base. In summary, what we have here is a car that can't quite pigeonhole itself in any of the market categories you might search in to find potential rivals. Qashqai-like crossovers, RAV4-style practical small 4x4s, and BMW X3 and Audi Q5-like premium small SUVs. Yes, there are elements of all these kinds of cars in this Honda's makeup, but ultimately it remains distinctively different, distinctively CRV which ultimately might very well be all you need.